evening, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm so appreciative of the opportunity to be part of uh, Community Voices. My mother took uh, one of the posters with my picture on it and hung it up in the Christiansburg Post Office. <laughs> and for years, I've enjoyed when people would come up and say, haven't I seen you somewhere before? <laughs> Saying, yeah, probably at the post office, referring to mug shots. Now that it's potentially true, it has a whole different feel to it. Uh, she's, uh, she's here tonight. My, my mother, Mary Ann Henschel Wood, and she has supported uh, me in just about every endeavor, uh, every endeavor I should have been up to, let's say, uh, for so many years and, and has been such an inspiration to me. She worked to raise, uh, as a single mom, to raise two knuckle-headed boys and uh, worked for 20 years as an Avon manager to do so. Uh, and when we got out of her hair, she uh, decided to pursue a lifelong dream of practicing law. She went to the uh, Paralegal Institute in Philadelphia for about four months, came back home, started uh, working part-time for a law firm in Roanoke, and applied to the Virginia Bar to read law, which you can still do in Virginia, and did so for several years under Barry Anderson, a uh, wonderful uh, friend and mentor in uh, Radford, sat for the bar exam, uh, passed it first go, hung out her shingle, and practiced law for 20 years after that. And I don't think uh, I'd have had the nerve to jump out of engineering into the uh, nonprofit world in the Crooked Road were it not for her gutsy example. Here we are. It's uh, the musical ties that bind centuries of music along the crooked road. Um, I hope the presentation is half as grandiose as the title sounds. It was 2003 when two gentlemen, one by the name of Todd Christensen, who's a community developer, and a folklorist by the name of Joe Wilson, we're both pondering how we might tie communities together in Southwest Virginia. And I think they started out by asking the exact right question, which is what do they have in common? Joe Wilson being a foremost authority probably on the music of this region pointed out what a shared musical heritage uh, that we all have in this region. Here's the Crooked Road region, 19 counties, four cities, and over 50 towns and communities. The people that settled the region in the 1700s, 1800s, brought various ingredients here. Uh, acapella gospel from German tradition that lives now in the old regular Baptist churches of the region spirituals and emotive singing that uh, free and enslaved Africans brought here with their ability to make music with a gourd that we now refer to as a banjo. And balladry brought here by Scots-Irish and English uh, and their love of the fiddle, the European fiddle that came here and mixed with this wonderful gourd instrument from Africa. And they brought these ingredients and they put them in a mixing bowl and those ingredients have been cooking for a couple of hundred years now and when we pull them out of the oven what's what we find is one of the finest musical traditions on earth. The families and the communities who've kept this tradition have produced the Carter family, the first family of country music, as they're called. Jim and Jesse from Coburn, Virginia, uh, Grand Ole Opry stars, and really pioneers in the golden era of bluegrass. And of course, Ralph and Carter Stanley, who have taken mountain music, uh, Ralph has now, around the world. And these two 
fellows were able to distill these mountains and this place down to their very essence and put them in songs that we could all sing and share. But just as we have these sort of well-known bearers of the tradition, the real, to me, the real heart and soul of the Crooked Road and this wonderful musical heritage that we have is the everyday folks who keep this music in churches, in their homes, in fiddlers' conventions, and in market square jams throughout the entire region. They make this music 365 days a year, and they do it, I believe, to stay connected to one another and to stay connected not only in this time, but to connect with the past and to connect with the future. And because uh, we have such vastly different backgrounds of people bringing this, uh, their shared, uh, or bringing their cultures and heritage here and mixing it together, it's not surprising that the music would be quite diverse. I want to illustrate that by playing to you selections from, this is a treasury of American music. It's a two CD collection of music from artists, current artists of the Crooked Road. And you have to go about 12 tracks deep into this to even hear a repeated type of music. This is old time string band. Classic bluegrass from a fellow who lives in Montgomery County, Olin Gardner. Acapella gospel from Lee the County. Eastern sky. At the pilgrim on, on the bright and shining cloud. God's children gonna take, take a ride. Hallelujah. We will rise right to shine on that. Here's Carter family music from Mac and Jenny Trainum and Floyd. ancient fiddle and banjo sound. When all you needed for a frolic or a dance or a get together were these two instruments. Modern bluegrass. Jug band music. Once again, a Montgomery County group called the Black Twig Pickers. And here's the jaw bark. And the joy in music. Here's an old time claw hammer banjo player and a bluegrass guitar stylist. So we certainly have these hybrids that you'll find throughout the music. Under my bed, you can set your little satchel on my head. Bluegrass gospel. Very traditional. Uh, this guitar style is very distinctive of the coal fields of Virginia, pioneered by some of the guitarists who played with Ralph Stanley. When I heard the voice of my Savior, I knew he was speaking to me. I wanted to pray. So we're nine tracks in got two more tracks, but I'm going to demonstrate those on the guitar. This is a style of uh, guitar playing 
that's very prevalent in the area and has been for a long time, sometimes referred to as uh, Piedmont style of guitar. kind of illustrate this diversity of music, old world ballads that, that live in the region. This is one that comes uh, in, in this country. It's called Little Margaret in the original uh, as a British ballad from uh, centuries ago would have probably been called Lady Margaret. Little Margaret sitting in her high hall chair Combing back her long yellow hair Saw sweet William and his new maid bride Riding up the road so near She threw down her ivory comb She threw back her long yellow hair Saying I'll go out and bid him farewell And never more go there And 50 more verses very similar to that <laughs> We often point out that, uh, you know, the Crooked Road certainly didn't start this music. Uh, we simply shined a light on it, and the world liked what it saw. And it's helped, I think, enhance a sense of pride that the people who make this music and who are part of this culture feel about it. And, and that's a really important contribution, I think, especially in a place where negative stereotypes uh, have had a negative impact on a collective self-esteem about this, this part of our culture. And as my good friend and mentor Olin Gardner points out, when he grew up, for someone to follow this, this music making, particularly into adulthood, was considered folly. And now uh, parents buy their kids the finest instruments they can possibly find. And you know, we've seen a whole different perspective in our efforts with traditional music education. Students who in Olin's time probably wouldn't have admitted in school that they were interested in hillbilly music now line up for spots in after school music programs um, and they're beginning to be looked up to and even envied, envied by some of their classmates. This is a, a good example. I always, I love this this gal in the lower photograph to the far right, her hands knitted together. She cannot wait to get her hands on her turn at that uh, fiddle. One of the most important things that we can do is help the, the region unearth and preserve its musical heritage. There's 26 of these wayside kiosks all along the 330 miles of the Crooked Road. They have the interpretive panels, and they have a radio broadcast that you can listen to. It's a five-minute loop that tells the story of that particular location's music. We're working on one of these for the town of Wise, and turns out when we got to studying the heritage music there, there was a group, the Sanders Brothers and the Virginia Sweethearts. They never commercially recorded, but they would play on WMVA radio in Norton, and they would take their reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder and record those programs. And as a result of our efforts to preserve this music and, and get a kiosk put together, every bit of their reel-to-reel -reel recordings have now gone to a studio and have been digitized and made available on a CD. So we're, we're in many cases, similar to this, I think we're talking about musical heritage that in another 10, 20 years, those reel-to-reel -reel tapes very likely would have found their way into the wastebasket. There's a great tie-in to Virginia Tech with this story. This fella here, fiddling Daniel Dale, was 87 when he fiddled as a guest on the 
with the Sanders brothers on WNVA in Norton. We have one recording of this gentleman playing, uh, you're talking about a fellow born in uh, about 1864, and uh, he fiddled an old tune with him called Shelby Rock. And it turns out uh, he has uh, there not only good fiddling music in this uh, family, but some good athletes. His grandnephew, Carol Dale, was a Hall of Fame wide receiver for Virginia Tech and went on to play with Vince Lombardi's championship Green Bay Packers. So uh, kind of interesting ties, small world. Let me talk a little bit uh, about challenges that uh, the Crooked Road faces uh, as a as a nonprofit, we, we like many others, uh, we face funding challenges, particularly in, in current times. And so our, our goal is to try to diversify our funding sources. And one of those is, for the first time in 10 years since the organization was founded, we will, we've, we're developing a, a program called our Believers Program, where people who have an affection for the Crooked Road would have an oper you know, the ability and opportunity to be donors, be uh, individual uh, gift givers uh, to help support what this organization does and what it means to uh, the, the Crooked Road or to the region. So that's uh, one of the uh, one of the certainly the challenges I think all of us uh, probably have, uh, particularly if we're in the nonprofit world, under understand those challenges. We also um, had a, a, a one of the a, an unsuccessful effort that we had to get the region designated as a national heritage area, which revealed some challenges that uh, probably uh, I think are shared by all of us. Uh, there's 49 of these in the U.S. Uh, they're designated by Congress as special places that have a piece of the American experience, a piece that's important to the overall story of America. We certainly feel like Crooked Road is part of that. I mean, the music that happened here has had a profound impact on American music. So uh, a, a National Heritage Area designation allows you, uh, it, it has certainly marketing value in and of itself. It also is a, is a funding source for one-to-one -one federal funding matching. Uh, and we had wonderful support uh, throughout the, uh, the region, uh, including from Congressman Griffith uh, and Senator Warner, and lots of towns and localities, including Blacksburg, Christiansburg, and Montgomery County. I'm so pleased to say that, that, were, that were really uh, appreciated greatly. Uh, there was also opposition, uh, claiming things such as national heritage areas or land grab schemes that uh, becoming a national heritage area would allow the National Park Service to take people's property away, um, and that the Crooked Road would become the managing entity for the entire region. And if that last one were true, I can assure you, no one would have been running away from National Heritage Area designation faster than yours truly. <laughs> one of the most... Uh, egregious claims uh, was that the National Heritage Area, uh, National Coal Heritage Area in West Virginia had shut down coal production in the 13 counties uh, that comprise that heritage area. And yet you, anyone with a little bit of time can, can easily find out that in fact those 13 counties produced over 88 million tons of coal in 2011. And we found, essentially, by talking to people in other heritage areas, that these other claims also uh, were found to be untrue. Uh, nevertheless, three counties became unsupportive of the designation. And since the Crooked Road is an entity that was f created from unanimity by the original ten counties, we felt that that was our role to play as a unifying organization that takes on things where we have unanimity of purpose. And when that didn't exist, we decided to drop the pursuit of that, that heritage area. Um, so 
I, I think the challenge that, that we faced and, and that we all continue to face is that when we're engaged in public debate, that we all insist that whoever comes to the table brings accountability, that they bring and deal in factual information. It's something I don't think we did nearly well enough, and when I say we, I mean a collective we. Uh, the Crooked Road, the press, our community and government leaders, we all need to insist that whoever comes to the table brings that, deals in good faith and, and, and goodwill. Finally, let me um, share with you, um, I, I don't consider myself a profound thinker, and I can, I can uh, produce many others to affirm that. <laughs> um, uh, but I do think we can be good listeners and good sharers, and so what I'd love to do is to share one of the most thought-provoking ideas that has come to my attention uh, in, in here in recently. Uh, the, the idea uh, or concept is referred to as your CQ or civility quotient, and its meaning is best illustrated through a lesson from uh, history shared by uh, John Hopkins University President William Brody in a commencement address that he did. So I'm going to, um, in fact, quote uh, Mr. Brody here. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. Though few people are aware, there were actually two riders that went out in the night to warn the citizens of Lexington and Concord that the British were coming. The other rider was William Dawes, both left Boston at the same time and both arrived in Lexington in time to warn Adams and Hancock to flee. But Revere went through the Middlesex villages and Dawes took a westerly route through towns like Roxbury, Brookline, Watertown, and Waltham. But the next day, when the Patriots confronted the British, first at Lexington and then at Concord, almost all of them were from the Middlesex villages, areas where Paul Revere had sounded the alarm. So conspicuously absent from, uh, were, were the militias from the areas in which William Dawes rode that for many years historians thought and mistakenly concluded that Waltham and its environs were hotbeds of Tory support. Paul Revere and William Dawes were both respected and reliable citizens both were merchant craftsmen. Revere was a silversmith and Dawes was a tanner. Both were fervent patriots who early on embraced the cause of liberty and independence. Yet only one of the two is enshrined in American mythology and memorialized in verse. Why is this? Author David Fisher suggests the answer lies in the scope of Paul Revere's circle of trust. He writes, when Boston imported its first streetlights in 1774, Paul Revere was asked to serve on the committee that made the arrangement. When the Boston market required regulation, Paul Revere was appointed its clerk. After the revolution, in a time of epidemics, he was chosen health officer of Boston and coroner of Suffolk County. As poverty became a growing problem in the New Republic, he called the meeting that organized the Massachusetts Charitable Mechanic Association and was elected its first president. When the community of Boston was shattered by the most sensational murder trial of his generation, Paul Revere was chosen foreman of the jury. In other words, Paul Revere recognized and lived a fundamental truth. No matter how intelligent or gifted or educated or capable we may be, in the real world, it is partnership and working with others that is most often the key to our success. Paul Revere's ride succeeded because the writer had a lifetime of civic engagement upon which to draw in the hour of need. When he came to towns, he knew just whose doors to knock upon, and they knew him. Revere was known and respected, and so people not only listened, they trusted and therefore believed what he had to say. 
William Dawes, on the other hand, had no such base of support and so was just a man on horseback yelling in the night. He arrived in Lexington with little else to show than saddle sores. Contrary to legend and with all due respect to the poet Longfellow, the midnight ride of Paul Revere is not the story of a single heroic individual changing the tide of history by virtue of solitary, unassisted actions. Rather, it is the culmination of trust and respect developed through years of personal interaction and support of others. I think there's a great, great lesson here for all of us who believe in community and what it means to be part of the community. Thank you all for having me here tonight. Thank you, Andy. Hi, my name is Jim Dubinsky, and I am a professor of English, um, founding member of this Community Voices team. But I think more appropriate for tonight, um, I'm the host of a New River Sampler, which is a, a show on WUVT every Friday morning from 7 to 9 that features this kind of music. And I want to I wanna just highlight that and make a PR pitch for WUVT, Wuvit, which is 65 years old as of April 1st one of the oldest student-run college radio stations in the country. And we play this kind of music every morning from 7 to 9 a.m., except for Sundays when we play it from 7 to 9 p.m. at night. So I think, you know, it's really important to, to recognize ways in which, um, you know, tonight we had Jack um, shine a light on this crooked road and, and the treasures of our music, and I think we ought to give him a thanks for that. And I have a pretty easy job. I'm, I'm, I'm here to ask one or two questions and then turn it over to y'all, which is good. And, and the first question I want to ask is a big softball question. And since, um, you know, <laughs> it's a, I might have a harder one here in a second. But, the first, you know, J Jack shined a light on, on the music. But one of the things that he didn't talk as much about that I heard him talk a little bit about today at lunch was how um, the crooked, the the word has spread, spreading the word about the Crooked Road. And I'd like, I'd like you to tell the audience a little bit about how this isn't just uh, any more a regional uh, 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 heritage treasure. The word has spread about this word. Sure. Um, the, the Crooked Road, uh, the goal when it first started in 2003 was to try within three years and have a nationally known heritage music destination and it had uh, a remarkable start and within about 18 months became uh, internationally known. It has had uh, tremendous success in garnering the, the attention of uh, both the national and, and international art, uh, audience and in this, uh, the March issue of U.S. Airways magazine, which goes in the back seat of every seat on all of their carriers, uh, there is a uh, page devoted to the best musical pilgrimages on the planet and sandwiched between going to Liverpool for the Beatles and going to Seattle for Jimi Hendrix is the Crooked Road. Yep. But the, the interesting thing is that the, the Crooked Road as an organization markets and, and promotes this region's music. But the, the real strength of it is when every venue in the region is engaged and is a part of the Crooked Road, uh, the, the, the magnification of what we're doing uh, is tremendous, and I, I really feel the uh, that's been the key to its success. It's not just that the organization uh, works every day to promote the region's music. It's every stakeholder that's out there. Every time Ron Kime at the, um, uh, the Big Walker Lookout puts an ad about coming to his place, he's got a Crooked Road sign uh, because he's an affiliated venue. Uh, when we have performances at uh, the Blue Ridge Music Center, 
uh, the, that place is talking about the Crooked Road. So they really lift one another up, and that has absolutely been the strength of this as a concept, is that um, every participant is lifting it up uh, and making it successful. Well, now I'm going to ask one a little bit harder question, and that's, and it's a question that um, I think people would be interested in, in knowing because at the end you, you talked about the, the difficulty in achieving national heritage area uh, status. And you indicated that there were three uh, counties that had some questions uh, and concerns. And so my question would be, it's a sort of a two-part question. The first is, what can people in this audience and people who really value the Crooked Road and the Crooked Road organization itself do to help lessen their worries and shine a light on, 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 on them and their organizations in such a way that they, they would see the value of perhaps this enterprise. And, uh, and if, if, if that were to happen, is the second part would be, uh, would there be an opportunity to apply later in the future? Uh, let me go in, in backwards order there. There would always be the opportunity. Um, we're, because the localities in southwest Virginia got behind this concept and, and, uh, and supported it y unanimously. We've always been, as I, as I mentioned there, a, a creature of, of unanimity. Um, and so the, the, the answer lies not so much necessarily with, with me or with the Crooked Road organization, but with the communities. If the communities uh, felt this was important enough, uh, then they they could certainly uh, initiate that that again. It was um, it, it was a funding opportunity and a and an opportunity to give the people who've kept this music for centuries now a wonderful designation um, and and to honor them and and what they've they've kept here and and what they've created. Um, and so there's other uh, uh, sometimes I think when when things become things that are talked about in newspapers and, and that sort of thing, that they, they take on a life of their own, they become uh, maybe a little bigger than they, than they really are. This was, this was a, a funding opportunity, uh, albeit a great one, uh, but there's, there's additional funding opportunities out there. Um, you, you may have a follow-up, well, I suspect. Well, just, just a quick one, and that's just, what can we do? I mean, since it is really the community, Right. How can we work as a, as, an, as a local community and as a regional community to help um, address the concerns so that um, they can be ameliorated, they can be overcome, they can be uh, satisfied? Well, uh, I guess the point I, I, I made at the uh, podium uh, was that uh, all of us collectively need to um, be sure when we engage in public debate uh, that we insist that every participant uh, stick to the facts. Uh, in this, th this, this was very much a deterrent, I think, and and um, there were uh, folks that 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 used clearly uh, misinformation in an intentional way to to sway people, and it, it, it's easy to tell someone something that um, has an emotional, you know, often when we deal with emotional issues, those are tough. Um, they're, they're, they're tough because oftentimes emotions we know override facts and, and, and rational consideration of things. But we have to, we have to continue um, uh, just uh, pounding the table and insisting that, this, that our decisions be based on good factual information, uh, and that people that, um, that come need to be engaged and challenged on what it is that, that they say uh, so that we can make sound decisions. Um, I, I think to some extent the, the Crooked Road is an organization that's about uh, community building. The people who are involved in it, all of them are they're about community, they're about Southwest Virginia, they're about uh, building something together. And um, I, I, I think you, we will find that there are many such organizations in, in the region 
and they all uh, are potentially subject to folks who, who maybe don't necessarily believe in community over, let's say, individual rights trump all. Um, so when uh, we, we've, we've all got to, uh, to, to live together and we've all got to, uh, to, to work together to, to have a quality of life that we can all appreciate. And there needs to be balance. There needs to be balance between uh, all of us who value our rights, uh, our, our in individualistic rights, our property rights, all of that. These are things we all value. Um, and, uh, but there needs to be common sense applied. There needs to be a demand that we base decisions on fact. Thank you. Sometime I'm going to get Jack uh, to do a, an interview and I'll get it on air when I can talk all about the music, which is what really <laughs> interests me. But tonight I'm going to turn it over from me to you. And so we have some people who are going to take the mics and I just would love to have you all ask any questions that you'd like to know about the Crooked Road, about the kind of enterprises they do, their educational programs, their music programs, how it might come up in this area, whatever you're thinking about. Who's, who's got a question? How did the word crooked get chosen? You know, whether or not this is the reason, there's a very interesting connection. In old time music in particular, there is a term uh, for some of the old fiddle tunes, they call them crooked tunes. And these are tunes that have irregular length, irregular measures, and so um, that, that's one term, term for it. Uh, the other obvious is the, the roads themselves. Have, have you ever driven from White Top to Damascus? <laughs> and, and of course, I think in Joe's, uh, Joe Wilson's wonderful book of the Crooked Road, he relates the, uh, the, the traveler's problem of, um, of, of seeing tail lights and thinking there's somebody ahead of them and then come to find out it, they're going around some, such tight curves, it's their own tail lights. But. <laughs> So, that, but there's those two uh, possible explanations. Uh, Jack, when I talked to uh, Joe uh, to interview him for my book, uh, he said that um, VDOT for years has been trying to straighten all these roads. Now you guys want to celebrate how crooked they are. So, uh, but my question to you is that you, you've been poking away at this music since high school days, uh, but you've been executive director now for a couple years, I guess, right? What do you know now about your, your native heritage? What do you know about your native music that you didn't know when you started this new job? Great question, Mike. Um, I, you know, I grew up in, in uh, Montgomery County uh, and, and the Blue Ridge portion. That, that's another entering, interesting aspect of the Crooked Road is that it unites not only uh, two fairly distinct regions in southwest Virginia, and that's the coal fields and the Blue Ridge. And so um, I, my, my circle of, um, of, of friends and fellow musicians was largely from uh, the Blue Ridge. So now traveling and, and getting to meet all the additional musicians that live in the, in the coal fields uh, has been just something I am thankful for every day because, you know, every week that goes by, I meet another Olin Gardner or another Buddy Pendleton and, and people, people like that. Um, I would have to say that also I've learned the most about the Coalfields region of Southwest Virginia and the fact that it is uh, very much a, a different place. It's a different... Um, feel to it. The music has a different feel to it. It's influenced if you hear Ralph Stanley sing uh, and you, you hear those old regular Baptist um, voices uh, coming right out of, of Ralph Stanley. So um, I think probably just, just learning so much more about the, the heritage music. Uh, tell you the truth, in the last, uh, as part of this, working on this wise wayside, I was not aware that one of the most storied fiddlers in the golden era of bluegrass lived in Norton, Virginia. 
a gentleman by the name of Billy Baker, and he's going to be part of the Wise Wayside. Billy Baker, you, you can hardly name a, a bluegrass band from the golden era of bluegrass that this gentleman didn't play with, including he was fiddling for Bill Monroe when the 1963 Newport Folk Festival took place. He played with uh, Del McCurry uh, in Del's uh, early years, played with Jimmy Martin, played with Ralph Stanley, recorded with the Country Gentleman. And, you know, you'd think I, people like myself ought to know about this guy, but this is what I mean about every stone you turn over, there's another wonderful heritage music story. They're just waiting to be told. So we were, were working, I had Billy come in and, and we uh, videotaped an interview with him. When I called him up to come, he said, oh, well, I'll send you the latest issue of Bluegrass Unlimited. Didn't know Bluegrass Unlimited this past, uh, this, this April issue, two-page two feature article about this gentleman who lives right here in southwest Virginia, Billy Baker. Just out of curiosity, and being such a patron of the Blacksburg Farmers Market, the Wednesday night jams they have at the summer in the summer months. So, is that a designated stop? And if not, what does it take to become one? And how does that happen? And then also to do a shout out for your all's Sunday at Draper's Mercantile. I'm sorry, Sunday. Aren't what? you all playing this weekend? Uh, Saturday at Saturday. Uh, the Draper Mercantile. Yep. yep. Yes. And then one more footnote before you answer that question is that. Do you also feel we need to become more political and pay attention to the issue that you were mentioning? You know, you were so correct about stating it very, you know, politically correctly, but we all need to be paying attention to the folks that act like this is a threat to us, that this is a threat to our community. It's really, really sad that that went on, and I think we all should pay attention to the politics of it. Okay. I, I, I also should mention, don't go away in case I need you to refresh me on what the questions were. Um, I also want to mention, because I promised to, that um, I'm coming back this way um, June 20th, uh, the pavilion at Smithfield, and, and to uh, a program that will in include uh, far more uh, guitar music than chin music. So... Um, uh, appreciate being invited to that. Uh, it's a wonderful music series that they have uh, there. So, um, uh, your first question. Um, the venues, uh, there are uh, now, now nine major venues along the Crooked Road. Uh, Ralph Stanley Museum, Country Cabin, the uh, uh, Carter Fold, the, the birthplace of country music, uh, Hartwood, the birthplace of country, uh, excuse me, the Blue Ridge Music Center on the Parkway, the Rex Theater in Galax, the Old Fiddler's Convention, Floyd Country Store and County Sales in Floyd, and the Blue Ridge Institute. Now, in addition to that, there are, if you look at the map of the Crooked Road that was up here, there are 58 affiliated venues and festivals. And these are places that have applied to be affiliated venues and festivals with the Crooked Road that have a two-year history, they have family and community-oriented uh, venue. They are consistent. So if somebody hears about it from us and drives for an hour, it's, there's not a gone fishing sign on the door. Um, and that they play authentic music, that, that this is what people come to and expect to find when they come to the Crooked Road. And so uh, 58 of those exist, and, and we ex there's more uh, that have submitted applications. Um, and the, the venues committee of the Crooked Road will uh, reviews uh, all those applications and picks the best, the best ones to be affiliated venues. Now, anybody, if you all decide to have some authentic heritage music tomorrow night at uh, uh, somewhere at the country store, we help promote that. It doesn't have to be an affiliated venue or festival. Our Facebook page is, is really active. We promote it there. We have a, a weekly email blast that we send out so people know where they can find the heritage music um, all the time. 
Does that answer the first one? Okay. Um, being politically correct. Was that the nature of this last question? Um, yeah. This, this was, to some extent, this was a political sort of driven, uh, there, was, there was ideology involved in, in opposition to the National Heritage Area effort. The, 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 what I don't want to see is, is continued efforts. I guess I want to be um, able to, to speak to other community building efforts that could potentially, for one reason or another, uh, be subjected to, again, opposition that's, that's not based on any sort of uh, reality. Um, and you know, I, I think we were sort of unique. The Crooked Road being this creature of unanimity, it wouldn't do us much good to have a national heritage area that ran from this county, this county, oh, got to jump over this county, this county, this county, oh, got to jump over this county. We, we're, a, you know, still a large part, even though it's a full 19-county region that we promote, there is a linear road there. And so the, the, the kind of unanimity of support is important to an organization like the Crooked Road. But there's other organizations that I, that I know from communications I've seen are in, in, in similar ways, uh, working to uh, build consensus and, and community and so forth that I know are being targeted by some of the, the same folks that were, um, again, I, I felt didn't come to the table with, uh, you know, with a, a goodwill and, and, and good faith. And I don't want to, I, I want those, those folks to understand, um, you know, what, what that's all about and, and what do we all need to do? I, I think we all need to uh, understand that, um, that 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 there are, um, in some cases, uh, folks who um, uh, you know may may have a philosophy of of governing and a philosophy, a political philosophy, that's not much about community building. Uh, it, it's about, um, I guess I'd, I call it a, a, a me philosophy. Not a not a we philosophy, and uh, I, I don't. I probably haven't given you a, a great answer to that as to wh what's the best thing to do. But um, but you, but you're right. It, it's a, it's a political sort of a thing. Crooked Road uh, also. Crooked Road's not a political organization, and neither are some of these other organizations that I think uh, could be targeted, if you will, because uh, they 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 feel like they're they're going to infringe on somebody's rights and so forth. So um, need to be just attuned to that and, and understand. Um, we, we just have a, it, we have such a unique opportunity in Southwest Virginia in this time. Uh, the whole mindset has become about working together and the Crooked Road, I wish I could take credit for it, but this was from 10 years ago, the Crooked Road was a catalyst that made a lasting impression on community leaders in this region about, holy smokes, look what, look what we can accomplish when we pool our resources, pull together. Um, and so there's, there's the, the lasting legacy, I think, from it. And, and I hope uh, we, we continue to grab the reins of that and understand what we, what we can accomplish with that mindset is no, no limit to it, I think. Hi. <laughs> it's very nice to meet you tonight. Um, I want to ask you an advice or your perspective on how artists can come together, because you've worked on this, to have the same project. But how was it sustainable for the artist to continue being participative and giving to the community while they have to have their own financial, um, economical, I don't know, develop, development or, I don't know how to explain this. There is this effort taking place right now, 
uh, of many artists. We want to collaborate, but we don't know how these artists can keep doing their art and committing it to the community to bring economical development to this town, to the towns around. There's no money coming in. There's no funds coming in. We're thinking of grants, to get grants for all of us working as a team. But there's still the missing part because all the efforts seem to vanish when the community doesn't take that step to give back. You know what I mean? There's events done, there's so many things taking place, but the people, they have to go back and take jobs that have nothing to do with their arts. And we're trying to figure out how can it be sustainable for our community to have artists and how can it be sustainable for the artist to keep creating for the community and taking place in everything they can. That's one of the things we are into exactly at this moment. So I think everything you said about the political points of view, we need to come all together. But there's always that me perspective, that unfactual perspective, emotional histories. So the hardship of continuing this cultural arts promotion um, needs to be, uh, I guess everyone needs to share their point of view on how can we make it sustainable for the artists to keep participating. Because maybe I, you had a scheme on how all these musicians have been able to sustain the program for 10 years, or maybe you have an idea now that you have a call for the people to donate how does these funds go to the artists, or how do the artists survive doing music or arts or any? Okay, can I ask what, what community are you speaking about specifically? Blacksburg. The Blacksburg community, okay. Um, well, <clears throat> you know, uh, the, the Crooked Road, uh, the, the by and large, 99% of the music that's made here uh, is made what I would call recreationally. We have some wonderful ambassadors for the music who make a living at it from all the way from Ralph Stanley uh, to uh, groups like uh, Blue Highway and Lonesome River Band. But by and large, this is a, what we're celebrating here is a, is a recreational uh, traditional art and um, we, we certainly endeavor to do everything we can to uh, to, to raise those those artists up and to um, do things that are of benefit to them. Uh, but uh, our, our goal is certainly not to convert the 99% of uh, these traditional musicians in the region into professionals. We're 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 not uh, attempting to do that. The the Sampler CD, I, I can't even remember now if I mentioned, uh, we managed to uh, pay out about nine, so far, about $9,000 in royalties uh, to the songwriters and the artists that are, that are on that. Um, but, you know, the, the, the larger question of, of supporting the arts, um, there, there's, uh, we, the, the Crooked Road has been, really from its start, it was about places and not individual musicians. So the Crooked Road itself connected eight major music venues where these artists come and play. So in a little less direct way, it, you know, what we do to promote the venues then promotes the artists and helps those artists. Um, I've heard Emily Spencer, who's in the White Top Mountain Band, and she's a member of our board, said, uh, has stated many times, uh, they have many more just simply opportunities and places to play uh, since 
the the creation of the crooked road. So it, it just it created opportunities for those artists to get out there, apply their trade, and some of them that take it fairly seriously. There's more audience there. There's an opportunity for them to sell their recordings uh, and and so forth. Um, so our our goal still is to uh, continue to provide and promote this heritage music that lives and breathes here. It's what people do as an everyday part of their life. It's not necessarily what they do for a living. Uh, and the and the the ability for people to come visit here who can immerse themselves in this this culture of music that we have. Uh, people who love traditional music and don't need to see it on a big stage, they're perfectly happy to go to uh, stand right beside the fiddler at the Market Square Jam and, and hear it up close and in a very personal way. Uh, and to some extent what we're talking about is, is what's called cultural um, tourism. Uh, so these, these are folks who are looking for an experience that they can take home, memories that they can, they can take home of, of having really engaged with a community, with a culture, with, with certain people. Um, don't know what else I might say about, you know, just in general about, you know, support for the arts. Um, it, 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 there's, there's so much more recognition these days about, and, and the Crooked Road is a, is a prime example of that, that the arts are so much more uh, than just leisure entertainment, that, that the arts have so much to do with the economic health and well-being of, of communities. Um, if, if you look at the, um, the economic impact of the arts, whether it's Virginia or the nation as a whole, the, the, uh, the, the dollars are staggering. And um, so it's, it's important to continue to, for us to always uh, look for ways to engage uh, with people who can help make uh, those, those are, help support those arts and, and make them uh, vibrant in, in the community. Well, thank you. Um, I know we have more questions. I can see it in the front, but we, I, I've been given the high sign by my boss, uh, and we try to stick to an hour. So perhaps you might be able to catch Jack after, the, after the, uh, the talk. And before I step off stage, one of my colleagues comes up here to do a formal thank you in closing. I'd like everybody to give Jack a, a really warm uh, applause. Thank you all very much.